Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us for this uh, panel webinar to discuss the film Gather, which everybody who's joined us has watched. I'd like to introduce myself briefly. I'm Mindy Kurzer. I'm at the University of Minnesota with the Healthy Food, Healthy Lives Institute, and I chair the planning committee for the annual conference on Native American nutrition. The screening today is hosted by the annual conference on Native American nutrition, which you know is sponsored by the Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux community through their Seeds of Native Health campaign in collaboration with the University of Minnesota Healthy Food, Healthy Lives Institute. We're hoping that this is the first of a series of webinars that we're gonna host this fall, and we will send out further information about that over the next couple of weeks. We know that you all enjoyed the film, and we're very, very fortunate to have with us today folks who were associated with the film, as well as some very, very talented moderators. And I'd like to begin by introducing the moderators. Uh, Janie Sims Hip. Janie, if you want to raise your hand, you can raise your hand. Janie is CEO of the Native American Agriculture Fund, and Ade Romero Briones is Director of Programs Related to Native Agriculture and Food Systems at First Nations Development Institute. And uh, Ade and some of her colleagues from First Nations were also producers of the film. And I would also like to in introduce Jared Walhow. Jared, if you want to turn on your video, Jared's doing technical support. And it's possible that at some point, Jared will uh, need to be called upon to help out. But now I'd like to turn it over to Ade who is going to be helping with the moderation of the webinar. And so, Ade, turn it over to you. Thank you, Mindy. It's so wonderful to be with you today. Um, I, I know you enjoyed the film as much as we enjoyed making it. And before we get started, I just wanted to make a few introductory remarks, and then I'm going to turn it over to Janie, and then um, we will launch into introducing some of the cast members, and we'll get into the meat of our discussions. But when we were doing this movie, and Sanjay um, has much more eloquent anecdotes about the period of time that we did this movie, we had no idea nobody had an idea that we would see COVID or we would, that we would see the weaknesses and the tenuous nature of indigenous food systems at that time. And so the movie is really speaking to issues pre-COVID but are just as relevant, if not more relevant when we're talking about post-COVID Indian country food systems. And I think the movie, does it well, that one of the biggest strengths, regardless of how many infrastructure weaknesses or supply chain issues that we have going on in Indian country, like we are the stories. We are the storytellers. And no matter what we're going through or how much we have to overcome, our stories are our strength. And they will, they bear witness to everything that we've been through and what we will go through and are our place of are the, the ground of our roots. And so hopefully we'll get a lot more sense about um, what that really means from our cast members who shared their stories publicly, which is not always an easy thing. And um, we look forward to some hearty discussion. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Janie so she can make some opening remarks and we'll get to it. Janie? And a day, I'm going to I'm going to do what you did. I'm going to keep my remarks really simple and short. And I, we just thank everyone for watching the film. It was an amazing film. It uh, really it brings home uh, for me. It brought home a lot of things that I've been uh, thinking about and working on for many years. But it was just a beautiful experience. I just have to say that I'm I'm a film buff myself and. Uh, it's, it's pretty incredible when you see stories transformed like that. And I was so um, excited watching it because, um, you know, as the Native American Agriculture Fund gets its feet under it and really starts to do more and more work um, with amazing partners like First Nations, but with amazing partners in every community, then uh, 
films like this and stories like this are really important to keep front of mind. And we're going to see these things play out more and more as, as the fund uh, do, does its work. But even without the fund, um, and Adea and I have talked about this before many times, uh, the fund is at, come, happening at an important time, but everything that was discussed in the movie, uh, in the film, is already happening and is already going to continue to happen well beyond the fund's existence. So I just wanted to say a few words and give everybody greetings, but I want to hear from from Elsie and I want to hear from Sanjay and I know we're going to pepper them with a lot of questions but the first thing I, I have to do is a little bit of housekeeping and I really wanted to remind everybody who if you're watching uh, the webinar today uh, submit questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and that's I think all you have to do is go and press that button and you can type in your question and we're monitoring the question box but um, Sanjay, I, I really wanted to um, start out with you and a day you could ask this question as easily as I could, but my first question to Sanjay before we move on to Elsie is, um, you know, how did you find yourself in, in this film and how did you, what were some of your, your most important revelations or experiences that you had as the filmmaker. I always love to hear from filmmakers, Sanjay. So give us your insight. Well, I, I, I joke that Ade was looking for a, an Indian filmmaker to make a, a movie on Native American food sovereignty, and I applied. Um, obviously, not the right kind of Indian, um, but you know, in all seriousness, this was not a film that I necessarily felt that I was. Um, I was going to be allowed to make, you know, as people who are aware of the history of media on Turtle Island, they'll, they'll know that the documentary film industry began in 1929 with a film called Nanook of the North by um, a, a white filmmaker named Robert Flaherty. It was very much a staged, stylized film, and it launched uh, an industry of, to, to put it kindly, ethnographic representations of indigenous cultures all around the world where an outsider would swoop in, cherry pick visuals, um, use kind of a, a westernized um, historical reference and piece together what they thought was the history or the context around these native peoples. And the unfortunate side of that, you know, as, 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 just as a human being is that a lot of Native American kids learned about their culture through these representations from outsiders. And it makes people feel that they don't have agency in telling their own story. That said, my first film uh, was called Food Chains. It was about a group of displaced indigenous farm workers from Chiapas, from Guatemala, from Oaxaca in Southern Florida, uh, fighting for the rights within the tomato industry. And that movie was called Food Chains and the group of workers are called the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. They actually live in a, a town in Seminole territory in Southern Florida. Um, they had a, di a difficult enough time getting to the table, so to speak, with farmers in the South as Latino. And so they didn't push the boundaries and call themselves indigenous. My second film, 3100 Run and Become, we had some blessed and, and really you know, sacred access to the spiritual running traditions of the Navajo, and the San Bushman in Botswana. So I, I felt that at least that I, I had some experience in learning how to stay out of the way in terms of telling native stories. And my filmmaking style is very much that, to allow people to be experts, not to bring in so-called experts from other realms um, or even from other tribal nations and to allow the characters the opportunity to drive their own narrative. So. Short story long, you know, I'd been discussing with day and her colleagues at First Nations the, the importance and, you know, obviously we can all share this, the importance of having a film like this and everyone was on the same page. But when push came to shove, we realized that maybe I wouldn't be a terrible uh, conduit for this since First Nations was promising and they fulfilled that promise, promising to be an incredibly active um, production partner. 
the folks in our film, you know, I could have never rolled up into Indian country and like found these people. They would have never spoken to me as an outsider, as someone not even from their tribal nation. Uh, but they knew First Nations, they trusted First Nations, and First Nations not only kind of gave us the access, but every step of the way, they allowed me to make as much of an Indian film as I possibly could. They brought in the indigeneity. I just brought in the kind of approach and the technical aspect. Um, Elsie, for example, she was a, uh, a friend of a friend of Mike Roberts, the, the president of, of First Nations. And this was the process. Mike said, my friend told me that there's this amazing young scientist on the Cheyenne River Lakota Reservation, and we can go see her this weekend. And completely trusting of Mike and a day's ability to, to pick great characters, we flew in, and it happened to be the weekend that Elsie was competing in the, the regional science fair in Rapid City, South Dakota, and got a really, we got a really quick introduction to her family, her history, and how dynamic her story was. So it was a, a true partnership in, in all senses of the word. You never know what's gonna happen. <laughs> you just get on the plane and you go. So Elsie, let's turn to you if you don't mind. Um, I just loved watching you in the film. And I, I remember you saying early on uh, that you were around your people and I thought for a minute that you were talking about your family. And then I realized that you might have been talking about scientists because that's the journey you're on. So can you tell us a little bit about that and when you actually determined that you were going to go down this path? And, um, and, and when you're talking about that, uh, you also said something about trying to prove what we already know. And I was just, I, I, loved, I loved it when you said that. And I was just hoping you could share with us your thoughts about your, your work, but also proving what we already know. Yeah, so first of all, hello everybody. And thank you for allowing me to be here. Um, so I've been in, interested in science my whole life. Um, I can remember, like that's what I told people I wanted to be when I was I mean, after I wanted to be um, a chef, um, after a chef or um, a waitress, I wanted to be a scientist. And I've always been a curious child, I guess. I've always asked questions. Um, I remember always being fascinated by the stars specifically, and that's kind of what started everything. I just started asking questions about what's out there. Why do things work the way they go? You know, just really... Um, basic scientific questions. I mean, science doesn't have to be complicated. And then, um, so that's, I kind of wanted to be an astrophysicist for, <laughs> for a while. And then um, every new science class I took, um, I, wanted, I wanted to be that. I wanted to be a biologist, then I wanted to be a chemist. And then um, I specifically, it was kind of the transition between my sophomore and junior year of high school when I took biology and then chemistry. Um, that I realized that there's, and I had this fantastic uh, science teacher, two fantastic science teachers in high school who um, were really supportive of me and really nurtured my passion for science and my family especially, um, asking me questions, challenging me. Um, I never thought that I couldn't do it because everyone around me always told me that I could. Um, and I was really lucky for that. And so I, I owe a lot of that to them, um, but I, with school specifically, it was really, people really nurtured the connections that I liked to see in science. I wasn't, I don't, science, Western science can be really narrow-minded and it can be like real tunnel vision in specific fields. And I didn't like that. I didn't just like biology. I didn't just like chemistry. I didn't just like physics. I like how they are all connected and how they're related to one another. And so I had, Western science teachers who really supported that idea, even though that's not really a traditionally Western notion or concept in science. So that's just kind of a little bit of background with my relationship with science, I guess. And then as far as the proving what we already know, that was something that I, when I watched the film, I was kind of 
I was shaking my head at myself a little bit because something I never wanted to imply was that traditional knowledge needed to be proven. Like it's, it's known, we, we know what's there and science doesn't need to prove that. And so I, um, I always try to caution others and I've tried to really correct myself in that sense that that was never my intention to make it seem that way. Um, but more that my relationship with science allows me to take something that is this westernized concept and use it to show people um, basically that that's not the only way that it is to look at things and that that can be a really narrow-minded way to look at things, a really myopic view. And um, so I certainly don't ever mean to imply that traditional knowledge needs to be proven um, because it doesn't. And my goal isn't to prove but more to, to utilize it. Um, to support our traditional knowledge and ways of being and doing um, in these Western spaces that that weren't made weren't made for our people. So Elsie, I've got a follow up question. Um, actually, a, a, a couple. How do you how do you deal with uh, Western scientists now that you're in labs, right, in your in your study field? And then the, the other side of that question is. Um, I think you mentioned it too, maybe, or maybe I assumed it from your work in the film. Um, you know, disease and, and health issues can be very much a social issue, but it's also a biology issue. And I'm just kind of wondering aloud how you navigate the labs as you're doing your work now and, and doing your studies um, in this really important field that you're in, but also how do you how do you translate that back to the community? Yeah, that's a great question and really important too because um, that's where a lot of disconnect happens, and I think academia is really um, a lot to blame for that. And so I'm at Stanford. I'm really lucky with the program that I'm in right now, and it's the human biology program, which tries to take a real interdisciplinary approach. It's human biology, not so much because you're specifically studying like the human body or something, but more because if you're talking about the biology of humans, you're talking about the relationship with humans to the earth, with relationships, relationships with humans to planets, uh, or pl plants and um, animals, sorry, and to other people. And so they try to really integrate that social side of things too. And you can actually get your Bachelor of Science or Bachelor of Arts, depending on which route you take. And I've been able to um, create my own area of concentration and design my course of study to support my degree. So my area of concentration is biochemical applications in the holistic health and well-being of indigenous communities. And that is a mouthful, but that is exactly what I want to do for the rest of my life. So um, some, that's been, I've had a unique opportunity to be able to bridge that within my degree. But prior to before I knew that uh, program really existed and was what I wanted to do, um, which was like only less than a year ago that I made that realization. Um, I just, I was always like my family really helped me stay focused and remind me that even though it's really easy to get like trapped in that organic chemistry class, um, which I still haven't been able to take uh, because of everything that's happening. Um, but to really, to not get that tunnel vision, that inevitably can happen and that I needed to stay grounded and remind myself why I'm doing what I'm doing always. And I would always supplement, um, I would never take a quarter of classes where I was just doing science. I would take my science class and then I'd right after I'd go to my native studies class. Um, and that really helped me organizing it that way and then staying in touch with the Native community at Stanford, being really involved, and then always talking about things at home and applications of the science has really helped me personally with that. But I think I've been in a, in a really unique situation with that, with a school and a community that really does um, try to support that and then a family that really, really helps me along the way. Um, so I can't remember if there was a second part to your question now that I've talked forever. I think that hit it for now. I'm gonna to switch to Sanjay for a second. Sanjay, um, talk to us, you're a filmmaker. Talk to us about how, uh, first of all, a really practical thing. How can folks actually get access to this, um, this film and show it in their classes? Because I think it would be a really powerful tool. So I'd love to know that. But then 
when you when after you tell us that, um, how do we get more native filmmakers? Um, and uh, we love you. We're so happy that you did the film, but, but it's so important too to get more native filmmakers in the industry, or at least I think it is. And I just would love to have your thoughts about how to break into that and and um, and what we could do to help. Great two questions. Uh, you know, I already forgot the first one. Uh, how do we get how do how do we get access to it so that folks can show it in their classes? So the, if people go to gather.film, our website, www.gather.film, there's a form to fill out at the top of the page. And that'll allow us to get in contact with you and share the right type of file so that you can either screen something to uh, a, a non-physically distanced classroom. And I know some people are, are, are in that safe space or we have options for physically distanced screenings as well. Live simultaneous screenings or links that people can download if bandwidth is an issue. Now, the important question is really addressing the colonization of the storytelling space. We all know, you know at, the, at the most basic level that there's different ways to tell stories. You know, we've all been kind of conditioned and me, as, as someone who doesn't come from a Western culture as well, we've all been conditioned to really only accept, you know, a three-act structure, something with a beginning, a middle, and an end. But when we go back to our own traditions, creation stories, to the more sacred ways of teaching, we know that many of those stories don't have a beginning and don't have an end that exists in that media. They ask questions, and the stories really just serve to, to inspire a direction or to raise our consciousness. So with, with, with that in mind, I think we first have to understand that the Western storytelling paradigm is very restrictive. Number one, if somebody wants to make a film that will get out into the greater Western world, they have to be able to raise money. And a lot of those fundraising avenues are very, very closed, not just to people of color, but people of a certain age. It's like, you have to have a network to be able to raise money and 95% of the people, maybe 99% of the people at the age of 21, 22, don't have that network unless they've got a trust fund. And no, no you know, hate to those who've got trust funds, but that's why you see folks in the documentary filmmaking space with the last name of Kennedy, with the last name of Pelosi. It's, you know, Rockefeller kids. It's like, you need to be able to have the, the, the physical space to not have to get a job to raise, to earn a living and you've got to have access to a lot of money. So that said, it's like, I think we have to depart from, from the kind of Western driven capitalist storytelling model, which requires glory and which requires, you know, a huge number of viewers and start creating things for audiences of the future. Like I frankly don't think when I start my films, I don't really think that many people are going to see them. They're definitely not gonna be like Aquaman numbers or like Batman numbers, but I can tell myself that, you know, in a thousand years, will people still care about Christopher Nolan's Batman? Maybe, maybe not, but do I want them to care about the work I've created? Yes, and so that requires me to approach things with that long-term standpoint. So that said, it's like in that framework, nobody can tell you what's a good story and what's a bad story. They can't say, oh, your story is not a three-act structure. Oh, it's not fundable. Oh, it's not going to be mainstream enough. And I think that is really important for Indigenous filmmakers. First of all, it's like we know, especially through the heartbreaking, you know, you know manifestations of COVID, <clears throat> that we're losing elders. I'm losing elders in my, in my own cultural context. And capturing their stories is of critical importance. So however you do that, whether you, you do it with audio tapes or whether you get out a phone and you film elders talking about their lives as, as it's culturally relevant and permissible, you know, those individual stories and capturing those stories are of critical importance. Secondly, it's through that process that I think tribal nations need to begin allocating funds to people on their reservations to tell their own stories. You know, we find that a lot of us coming from the outside have the solutions, have the ideas, but unless there's real political and cultural will from within communities, 
nothing ever gets done. So those who really care about native filmmaking need to find ways to push their own leaders to allocate funding, to allocate resources, or even access to elders so that those stories get told. Of course, there are magnificent organizations like Vision Maker Media, um, like Sundance has a documentary film initiative for indigenous peoples. Those are critical for putting out more mainstream native stories and for getting native filmmakers the opportunity to integrate into the Western kind of capitalist filmmaking stream, either doing commercials, doing feature length films, and really representing natives in Hollywood. There's plenty of stories that, are, are that people are trying to tell of native people um, that aren't being helmed by natives. And in many cases we've seen even as recently as Longmire, um, they're not even picking native actors. And that was just 10 years ago, native actors to play main native roles. So giving natives visibility within that Hollywood space is critical, but at the same time, looking at the long-term ramifications of stories being lost, um, I think that's equally important. It would help if I learned how to do technology a day. <laughs> a day I'm going to turn to you as a segue and thanks Sanjay for for that great response um and you may need to unmute yourself <laughs> so um you know you all were producers you and First Nations and you all worked so so hand in glove it sounds like with Sanjay to get this done um can you give us some thoughts about about funding these sorts of things and funding films like this or storytelling narratives and you know what people can do but what the struggles are um you all have a really you know front row view to to that issue a day and we'd love to hear from you yes and sanjay thank you for um i think sanjay is very humble because one of the major issues that First Nations had prior to meeting Sanjay is, um, you know, we've been funding, we used to be the number one funder in food systems, now Janie is, but um, we, we've been funding for years and the stories out there are real and they're very relevant and they need to be told. I think anybody in Indian country food systems knows that um, the problem is, is getting somebody to put down the money to actually make it happen. And I run in, the, I, I work in the food world. Like if we don't have money, like we make do, right? We can plant seeds if somebody's not paying us. We can feed people if somebody's not paying us. But you cannot make a film unless somebody's paying for that camera or somebody's paying for people's time or somebody's paying for the editing. I mean, there's so much so many costs in filmmaking that there we, there was no way we could have done it without a filmmaker coming with an actual plan for funding um, and so first nations and in the beginning of the film sanjay and first nations we had some real discussions about so about native filmmakers and one of the issues um, that came up is that we want to do this film but the, but funds are only accessible to 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 those who have experience. So like I really feel for native filmmakers. Until we did this movie, I had no idea how difficult it is to break through in the film world. It's it's incredibly hard, and it's all about connections and friends. And um, Sanjay was so gracious to share that with us. Like we didn't. He he introduced us to folks. We have no idea. It was a whole new world to us. And so Sanjay also committed um, and he, to supporting and mentoring native filmmakers along the way. And so we've had interactions and um, you know, meeting points with a lot of filmmakers along the way through this journey. Um, I think it's all the more apparent that there needs to be a whole movement around the native filmmaker space that um, hasn't quite happened. I mean, we see rumblings here and there but really like filmmakers need money. And I'm not saying like a $10,000 grant, like I, we're talking like lots of money. And one of the most amazing things to me about this film, which I had no idea, right? You watch a movie, when you go to the, the movie theater and you have no idea, but like the cost of the camera that we use for this film was incredible. Like I don't, 
and pulling that off on our own, like we wouldn't have been able to do it. And so we really, and Sanjay will attest, like it was tough. It was, it was such a tough process to make this film because we wanted to be true to not only our work, but indigenous communities. But we know that there's like worlds out there that are not accessible to indigenous people right now. And that was just apparent. But um, Sanjay, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Well, we, we were, when we were with Sammy Jensaw and the Ancestral Guard filming them in dugout canoes on the Klamath River, we dropped one of those cameras in the river, you know, so that was a problem. Um, so yeah, you know, I, I, there, a day in Janie, you guys are tackling this head on, but I think, what, what's the stat? 0.3% of all American philanthropy goes to Native-led organizations working in Indian country. And when we look at the source of that philanthropy, it all pretty much comes from extractive fortunes, uh, people who required stolen land for petroleum extraction, for other commodities, for timber, for these large-scale, pre, really pre-industrial revolution and you know pre-1900s activities, and so I think we as a society need to ask ourselves, you know, why can't Native issues receive this form of reparations from an industry that was in pretty much entirely created by land barons and land stealers. The money is out there. I think that society needs to make an argument about why these stories need to be preserved. And again, it's like, they don't need to be preserved for the rest of us to see. You know, many of the stories that we came across and gather, we would, we would never, you know, have dared film, um, much less share with the outside world. There were so many secrets of indigenous food systems that allowed them to stay unmolested for hundreds of years or thousands of years. And now when we're in the age of, you know, and I've got many friends who are hipsters and there might be some hipsters who are on this chat and I mean no disrespect, but you know, there is a, a hipster fad every week. Some of the things that, that Twyla is, you know, picking behind me, these Apache sunflowers, you know, you could imagine, I mean, they're, 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 they're harvestable two hours away from Phoenix. You could imagine that if somebody felt like sneaking or trespassing onto Indian land, picking these flowers, picking the other agaves and other types of squashes, they could sell them into the Whole Foods pipeline, farmers markets pipeline. And, you know, frankly, that's happened in the past. So, you know, a long way to say that there's a lot of money out there that's going into non-native industries. And I think that we need to make space for it, not just to go to revitalizing native food systems, but telling stories around those food systems and other systems. So Elsie, thanks Sanjay. I'm gonna move back to you, Elsie. Um, tell, your, your work is very, it seems very specific to your culture, your, your tribe's culture. But I, I also look at it and I think what you're doing is totally, um, workable for other tribes cultures right uh, and i'm just kind of wondering what your thoughts are about that right now as you're in the middle of of your work and whether you have any um any thoughts about how to make the studies that you're doing even more expansive um, across multiple tribes foods but also cultures and the other thing i wanted to ask you too is um have you do you have do you have issues when you're in the lab when you're working with western scientists do they do they try to to make you be something you're that you don't choose to be uh in order to be heard or respected in your field yeah um okay so first part of that question it is i do it because i know what works for my people and I know what I've grown up with and what I've been grown up or what I've grown up around, what I've seen, what I've been told. Um, but certainly like acts of food sovereignty and reconnecting with traditional food ways is not a, my tribe specific uh, movement, which is why, as you can see in the film and it's the way I 
like to look at that aspect of it is um, like I know Sammy talks about it all the time like we know what works best for our communities and our people and so like I couldn't tell Sammy um, what to do on Yurok but I can support that by telling him that I know that he knows what he's doing and so I think one of the biggest things well, and then, okay, I'm, I'm already distracting myself, but another thing is that with Buffalo specifically in mind, because that's what I know, Buffalo aren't just a Lakota thing. I mean, Buffalo went from north to south, down into Mexico, up into Canada, west coast, east coast. Buffalo were all over, and while not all tribes are Buffalo-oriented cultures like mine, um, a lot of tribes had involvement with Buffalo, and that was taken from them. Be, when the buffalo were intentionally um, almost completely eradicated and so i think part of reconnecting to tribal or to traditional food ways is reconnecting to buffalo in a lot of ways for a lot of people not just mine and that's who i'm who i'm specifically considering but um i know efforts of my dad's before i was born he was talking to people from all over the country tribes all over the country wanting to reconnect and telling their stories about what buffalo mean to them meant to them traditionally and so i think there's kind of this idea that buffalo are for like north and south dakota or something like that and, and that's it and plains tribes only and i mean to a certain extent ish but that's that's not really the only case and so that's even what like the very nitty-gritty specifics of my research really isn't just applicable to where i'm at um but then if you look at it from the the more spiritual side and less of the just buffalo specifically but trying to occupy these western spaces to really try to do some damage control and to also just reconnect to traditional ways and uplift um, our indigenous ways of knowing and doing things that's applicable all across the board and that leads into my answer to the second part of your question is in labs that isn't always understood and i mean i've only worked specifically um in one lab and that was for my or so far um was for my research project that was highlighted in the film at um, South Dakota School of Mines and Technology. And I'm so thankful for everything they allowed me to do there and I got to use their fancy equipment and I had a wonderful um, Bulgarian organic chemist, chemical engineer who just signed up to be my mentor. She just agreed to do that with me and that was phenomenal and she really supported what I was doing to an extent. Um, she supported it's so in so far as that she could see the cold hard facts of grass fed buffalo meat and she understood that and she could see it in in the chemistry of the samples we were looking at um but as far as application as to why i was doing that 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 conversation we didn't have that, that conversation didn't last very long um between her and i um and she wanted to do she wanted to continue research in ways that I didn't want to. And I had to be really careful about, and I still um, worry about it and think about how I need to be in control of those samples and how I need to be really careful about what happens with this research. Um, and that's something that I think is really important kind of going back into the idea of navigating the Western science academia world is that it's just really important to have native scientists who are leading the research at these doing the research that is going to affect their communities because research scientific research um, does not have a great history in in indian country and that's something that needs to needs to stop first of all but needs to be repaired and healed and um because research can really benefit our communities when it's done ethically and in the right way and so I want to be able to do that um, and know it isn't always what people want to hear or what people um, want to see or support. Um, so far at Stanford, I've had a lot of support um, and they have connections with a, a research industry that is native owned and run on Cheyenne River, whom I'm like in an internship with right now and they have connections to Stanford um, to try and make sure that the research that they're doing um, is being 
is held in control and Missouri that's what Missouri Breaks does and it, that it's native owned and operated and specific to our people for our people by our people um and so that was a rant but I hope I covered all the pieces <laughs> we love your rants Elsie <laughs> day I have a question for you uh you're a lawyer <laughs> and I immediately when I was watching this movie uh you I'm a lawyer too and so you and I both probably saw it with that set of glasses on too and what what we heard and what we saw and how could it actually be transformative in terms of policies that can really help protect our foodways but also push for change have you all considered um what next uh with the film and and how it might be uh useful in that in in pushing those kinds of policies in our direction not against us but for us well, this is exactly why I tap you. I, if people don't know, I, Janie is my mentor. <laughs> University of Arkansas Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative. If anybody out there wants to study food and agricultural law with an Indigenous perspective. Um, well, I think first First Nations in going through this film, I don't know, Sanjay, how long did this, how long have we been in production? Two and a half years? Longer. We, start, we started discussing it in June of 2016. Yes. And so we've been through essentially about two, we're going into two cycles of the Farm Bill, Janie. And so, um, you know, that's how we measure agricultural lawyer years, right? How many cycles of the Farm Bill have you been doing this work? So this movie has gone through two cycles of the Farm Bill. Um, we're finally coming out with like a public, a public showing. And so the idea is that we would show this um, to people who are working both on the Farm Bill and our policy makers. But I plan on tapping you more closely, Janie, to figure out how to best do that since you are like our, our policy guru, our Washington, <laughs> know it all. <laughs> you know them. If they don't know Janie, they're not really in food and ag law in Washington. <laughs> well, I just, I, I'm just glad you said that today, but I immediately thought about how effective it would be as a tool to make some points here, you know, when we're trying to tackle policy that really isn't working. And I just wanted to share with everybody too, uh, Tam, uh, Twyla and Sammy were going to try to join us today and they just had things come up that kept them from joining us. But I'm looking at Mindy's picture and I'm thinking maybe we need a, a Redux too so that we can uh, schedule something around uh, Twyla and Sammy's uh, voices too. So that I think that would be great. Um, but I also, um, and Sanjay, or any of you could really answer this. How do we, COVID, COVID ha, is proving to us a lot of things, as Adesh said, but how do we actually um, mobilize even more effectively around uh, dealing with hunger and food access in our communities and repairing those issues uh, through the message of this film? Do any of y'all have any specific ideas about that? dead space. <laughs> I, I'm looking at a day. <laughs> I can oh. do it. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Janie, please. <laughs> I can do it. I'll, always ask a question you want to answer yourself. I just got so excited and motivated. And, and maybe it's a function that, you know, the fund is now funding projects all over the place. Like, you know, we, we're going to, First Nations is going to be here long after we're gone because we expire in 2038. And I really see a lot of as much as we can get done through the fund to happen. But I just, as I look at, at everything that's happening in, in the communities that First Nations is funding in and now the fund is funding in and, and you know, Intertribal Ag Council is there out in within communities. There's so many amazing things that are happening and I just see all of them driving towards making sure that we all have food, that we have secure food, that we self-determine 
around food and that we self-govern around food. Um, maybe we don't say that that's the outcome of each one of the actions that we take, but I think collectively and, and, and you know, together, we're gonna achieve those, those goals um, through food. And everyone, Twala's doing her thing, Sammy's doing his thing. Um, I had some really specific questions about him, about, you know, fighting for, uh, fighting for the right to fish and now fighting for the right to have our foods. Those are really important issues. And I think this film is really captured for me um, the, the, the drive and the excitement around that. So. I mean, the, the thing that was really, really exciting for me, um, when we were approaching the, the film, of course, there are, there are some legends in the indigenous food sovereignty space, Winona LaDuke, there are some folks that have really established themselves in the last decade on the chef side, like Sean Sherman. Um, one of our approaches was tr to try to tell stories that a lot of folks didn't necessarily know. Um, and that in, the, in that sense, you know, we weren't necessarily filtering against people who were of a certain age. Uh, like, look, we had a, a great opportunity to spend time with Twyla, with Nephi, but it was really exciting to me to, to recognize the work of a lot of young people in this movement, from Clayton Harvey, from White Mountain Apache, who runs Nde Bakia, uh, the People's Farm, to uh, the Ancestral Guards, Sammy Jensaw, his brothers, and other folks in the Yurok, Hoopa, and uh, Klamath tribes and Karuk tribes up in Northern California, Oregon, um, as well as Elsie. And there are hundreds more um, who have just realized that with a lot of external factors, and I'm, I'm speaking on Sammy's behalf in a way I, I, I don't feel comfortable with, but since he's not here, I'm just gonna to promote him a little bit. You know, in terms of California and Oregon, the physical space, and in terms of Indian country, there aren't many places as far away from a so-called population center as the Yurok and Hoopa. Uh, they're pretty much ignored by Sacramento, they're ignored by their state capital. They're definitely ignored by, by uh, the reservations, ignored by the border towns as well. And those kids have realized that education is not gonna save them, um, that policy um, is not something they, 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 they're gonna be invited to, to help change. And they have to change things for people as early as they can. So they're going out to six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10-year-old kids. Um, just like Twyla is in this photo with a young uh, San Carlos Apache girl, May, they're going to them and then taking them out in the river and creating relationships between their land and these kids. And Sammy says it, like, they're doing it as a last resort. Like, they've seen the dam on the Klamath River harm their life ways. They've seen climate change, you know, decimate their hope even for a healthy river once the dam is, is, is removed. And they're forced to approach these things from of, um, not necessarily a place of resilience, but a place of, of sorrow. Um, and they're finding the hope within that. And they're creating programs on a person by person basis that will help to spread that knowledge and ensure that this next generation has access to the tools that they need. So, um I'm just going to jump in there real yeah, quick. Yeah, please. Um, yes, because I think for me, you know, being born and raised in Cochiti and in Hall Creek, Oklahoma, and I'm, I'm sure you know this too, Janie, like there's so many beautiful stories in Indian country. There's so many like amazing storytellers, and I feel so privileged and lucky to be able to grow up with some of them. And in this film, like some of those folks are sharing their stories and their skills with the rest of the world. And that's, that's not even the tip of the iceberg. That is like looking at the iceberg. We have so many beautiful, beautiful stories in Indian country. And I, I hope that comes through in the movie. Um, and you know, to me, the, the most honorable thing is my storyteller, my grandma, was my storyteller growing up and the movie really started off with her. She was one of the first people that Sanjay interviewed and she's not in the film because I was still learning what we needed for a movie. And just a little snippet, I think 
this was the first time me and Sanjay were like got in a, a little snazzle because <laughs> I had an interview people like for hours and just like, okay, do you know how do you know how much how much each minute in this movie is costing us and you're having us talk to people for hours at a time? Like we gotta rework this. So we I had a lot of learnings too, but our stories are beautiful and we hopefully we captured that and, and it communicated that in the film. <laughs> So um, Elsie, I'm, I wanted to turn back to you and and uh, can you give can you give us some thoughts about um, the really um, important role younger younger voices are as we move forward? Um, I've seen you on various podiums, you know, talking at various meetings, but um, I just would love to hear from you um, where you think younger voices fit into all this. Yeah, so I, I'm so humbled by all of the opportunities I've had to be able to speak and um, I, I certainly don't speak for everyone. I certainly don't speak for all of my people, um, but I, I do try to do my best to, to align with what, with what I can. Um, and one of those things is that, I mean, in a lot of our cultures, children and youth are looked at as being sacred. I mean, we don't, our cultures aren't ones who um, put, who, who are ageist or um, who put um, older folks at such a, as being better than. We respect our elders and have the utmost respect for our elders. And I certainly would never claim to know more than anyone older than me, any elders in my community. Um, definitely not going in that route. <laughs> um, but I do know that every elder that has ever talked to me has told me how important it is um, to do what I'm doing. And everything I do is because of the support that I've received from people that are older than me and who tell me that my voice matters and that I need to use it. Um, and they believe in me. I mentioned before that it's been my family and my community who has supported me so much. It has been like graduation cards from um, one of like the oldest tribal members um, telling me how proud of me she is and how I need to keep doing what I'm doing whenever it gets hard um, and that my grandma would be so proud of me if I got to meet her. And it's that, um, that is what tells it all. And I believe in myself because they believe in me. Um, and so I do what I do for them and for future generations because, I mean, as lots of people say, like, I want to be a good ancestor and I do what I can to do that. Um, and so I think it's really important that people remember um, that it is not within our traditional cultures to silence the voices of young people who have may or may not um, have been um, really tainted in a, in a sense by all of these colonial ideas or the ways that we're forced to live in this world or put um, middle-aged white men's voices at the forefront of everything and that that's not the way that our communities operate. That's not the way the world operates. Um, and so I think it's really important to remember that. Um, and I mean, I'm, I'm certainly not speaking on behalf of all youths either. Um, <laughs> I do not represent all youths, but I know that there are a lot of young people that I have met who are really passionate about a lot of things and who have a lot of really good ideas. And we come from a different generation. We come we were born into a different time and things are different now and the world is moving in a different direction. And so I think it really is important to, to hear people out, to listen, um, because we have things to say. Um, and so I'm thankful for every opportunity I've had to be able to put my two cents in. Um, so <laughs> I'll stop there. Those beautiful words. and. Uh, we have a couple of comments in the Q and A. It says what Elsie said, <laughs> so <laughs> you're you're getting some of this <laughs> from the comments. The other thing I wanted to uh, let you all know is that uh, there's a couple of folks who posted comments about um, 
some additional ideas for another film, Sanjay. And um, I'm looking at one right here that uh, Alaska is fair game. <laughs> so that's a really big space for you to actually think about your next film. Uh, a great stories up there. And the other thing I wanted to ask Sanjay is what are we not seeing? What ended up being on the cutting room floor? I know enough about film to know there's a cutting room floor. Well, you know, we, we were very cognizant of the fact that we were going in and stealing stories. And, you know, every, every time you take someone's story, there's a, there has to be an exchange. The exchange is usually never as, uh, ne never real compensation for that story. Um, and even when people came and met us to share their stories, it was with the expectation that their stories would be offered to the world. So obviously we couldn't put every story in the film. So in the first few years, we hired native journalists to actually go and, and tell those stories. And we, we pitched those stories with Kim Baca, uh, formerly of Naja, to you know, major newspapers, both in Indian country and outside. But if there is a Pueblo filmmaker out there, I'm gonna speak on behalf of a day for two seconds. She's from Coach de Pueblo where there is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful culture and an incredibly horrible dam. In fact, the largest earthen dam in the entire world was built on Coach D. Uh, it's created a lake that a lot of people use to go and stand up paddleboard. The bottom of the lake is buried innumerable Coach D artifacts, several villages, it's down river on the Rio Grande from Los Alamos and the, the dam has, has, has blocked and collected a number of um, radioactive filings. Water has leached from underneath the dam to flood Pueblo farmlands. When the dam is decommissioned, there's a huge question on the toxicity and the radioactivity of the, the sediment. It's incredibly important, it's timely, but it requires a Pueblo perspective. Um, and of course, it's not so far away from Santa Fe and Albuquerque, and there are a number of great Native filmmakers, both young and not so young in those communities. And uh, I know I would do my part as, as, a, as an advisor or as an outsider to, to help ensure that that story could be told from a Pueblo standpoint. Maybe not even for the entire world, that's for the, the community, but you know, there's so much resiliency and, and beauty in the story of the Pueblo people, and it doesn't begin and end with that dam. Or so, any, I would say, or any dam. I think Cochiti has our dam, but I don't, I don't know one indigenous community that doesn't have their run in with the Army Corps of Engineers. Just right, <laughs> exactly. A day, tell me, tell me what your thoughts are about. Um, about the future of filming food sovereignty projects like this. I mean, I'm, I, I don't want you to verbally commit to anything, but it just seems to me that we really should consider how we can do this as all of us, because I for one don't wanna look up and have lost these stories. And I think we're at this amazing moment in time. So I'd, I would love to hear your thoughts about what next? What, where do we go from here in capturing these food sovereignty moments <laughs> that are happening before our very eyes? For sure. I think one of the biggest learnings, and thank you, Sanjay, for teaching me this, is like, we, I had all these grand ideas, and Sanjay always had to pump the brakes because he was like, no, you know, like, these cost money. Like every time you decide to have a new idea, somebody has to edit, somebody has to like actually organize us. I mean, so it's not, and again, this is, I have never worked on a film. And so there is so much, I, and you know, I, I won't even get into the details, but there's so much that didn't make it into the film because one where you don't have enough time and you never have enough money. Sanjay taught me that very well. And so what we created this very beautiful film with what we had. I have much props to Native filmmakers because I have no idea how they get these things done. Um, but from the funding side, you know, 
these, like it's no small task to fund a movie, especially a good one. If you want to put a YouTube video um, off of your iPhone, that's one thing. But if you want to make a quality video, like you, you need some attention from some very deep pockets. I haven't figured that part out, but I would love to explore that. Sanjay to me is one of, is a filmmaker who navigates the space that is not dominated by like guts and glory. So like his films actually mean something. I have no idea how he created that funding network that supports those kinds of films. Um, but that is something that definitely should be replicated for indigenous filmmakers in Indian country. I am down. Like, if we can figure this out, it would be amazing. Sanjay, I, I totally agree. I totally agree. I think an offline conversation <laughs> is necessary. So Elsie, I, wanna, I want you to, um, one of the things you said in the movie was uh, in decline narratives. Do you remember saying that versus uh, success and forward moving narratives? Can you tell us a little bit more about what you were thinking? I think that might have been when we were discussing this panel, but um, we, um, I had a class on indigenous representation in film and media just this last spring. Um, and Ryan Redcorn, actually, you might know of him. He's quite the comedian. He's pretty funny, a uh, native comedian. Um, anyway, he came and he talked to us um, about declension narratives uh, versus progressive narratives. Um, and the first thing I thought of was gather film um, because this was just last spring a few months ago and so he talked about how um, even within uh, the space of native filmmakers like himself um, we overwhelmingly see and specifically historically in the very white dominated film industry uh, we see these declension narratives where maybe the where maybe native people start up here doing well and then people come in and then they're defeated and they're sad and they're poor and they're in these food deserts and it's terrible um and and that's he was really speaking about how while it is important to share i mean indigenous communities face a lot of hardships and it's important for people to realize that this whole world doesn't just work in beautiful harmony right now and that there are a lot of things that people um, need to see um, but he was talking about how as a native filmmaker himself he wants to kind of highlight these progressive narratives where the story doesn't end with native people somewhere lower than they were before in the trajectory of the storyline, that they're on the rise or that they're at the top, that they're making it. Um, and I thought about how in this film, this film, we talk about a lot of the things that were horrible, like the, a lot of the film starts and there's a lot of history in there. And you see that big picture of all the Buffalo skulls that makes people want to cry when they see it. And we talk about that brutal history. And then the whole film shows how, how people are overcoming that and transcending that and restoring traditional food ways and reconnecting with traditional food ways and um, persisting. And so I think that's really cool, a really cool aspect of this film, um, a really cool concept to consider for other native um, filmmakers and just stories in general, storytelling, not just film as the only medium. Um, I don't know tons about this realm. It's not my uh, not my focus, but I think that's something that everyone can relate to because we've all been exposed to it. We've all seen that, um, and it's it was something that I kind of I mean I've I'm familiar with the concept of poverty porn, but um, I didn't really realize how deeply that that extends. And so I think that's something I'm really grateful for this film for, and I hope that people can see that and think about that too. I agree. I've got another question for you, Elsie, before I move on. Uh, to, where, you, where you are, there's a, a resurgence of Buffalo, right? And your family is deeply involved already. But how, how does cattle versus Buffalo bison, how, do, how, does, that, how does that happen? <laughs> Uh, because I've seen so much uh, 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 back and forth, and I'm just kind of wondering aloud what you, what your takeaway is from 
the push and pull of cattle and, and buffalo. Yeah, you saw me grimace when he said it. Um, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just kidding. It's, it's an important conversation to have. I mean, it's unavoidable. It's, it's uncomfortable because it's where a lot of resist, where, you, where people get met with a lot of resistance. And it's where you have people who are going down with the same ideas, want the same things, and then you hit that issue and that's where people diverge. Um, and I think it's really important for a lot for everybody on on both sides or on no sides to 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 ask why and to think about where they specifically fit into that and what what their problem is with that. For me, I mean, my I have nothing against cattle ranchers inherently. I don't think they're bad people. Um, but if I'm talking about food sovereignty, I'm not talking about food security. Um, I mean, there's there's a really important food security aspect of food sovereignty, but um, like by definition, food sovereignty includes culturally appropriate and specific foods, not just um, control over your food system. It requires alignment with traditional ways. And I like my kind of real short, quick answer to this question when I met with it is that cattle weren't in our creation story. And so if you want to go back to traditional ways, that's not where cattle are. And I understand that it's a deeply complicated issue because this, the history of the United States and colonialism, we all know is an absolute fiasco. And that's what's to blame for this. That's what's to blame for even with amongst um, indigenous people there that it's not just resistance between um, like the federal government and Native nations or Native people. It's, it's a lot of the times within our, within our own communities. And that's something that we need to be talking about and thinking about. And it's something that my dad's talked about for many years and he's confronted this himself. And so I've had guidance from him on how to navigate this. Um, and I mean, frankly, I don't know. I, I don't know a simple answer to that. It is, it's a sticky situation and it requires a lot of input from a lot of people. And um, it talk, it requires thinking in different ways than our uh, tribal governance systems typically tend to think. And it requires um, decolonizing different uh, realms of different, um, like realms that people are working in. It requires decolonizing like our own minds of certain things. And I'm not trying to say um, that one, that I think any better than anybody else, but um, I certainly don't mean that. But when I think about reconnecting to a traditional food way for my people specifically, I don't see cattle in that picture. And people don't like that. People don't like to hear that all the time, but that's, that's not gonna change on my end. And so, but I'm willing to have the conversation with folks because we need to have the conversation. And I think that there's, I, like I said, I really don't know. I don't know what that looks like specifically. This is the type of stuff I sit and talk for hours about with my dad. And so this is things that I'll sit and talk for hours about with my brother who's getting involved or people at the NAC who are also from South Dakota um, at Stanford. And we'll sit there and talk about like, What's, what does that look like? And this is things that I was just reading uh, earlier today. It's, I used it in a paper of mine that talked about when cattle were introduced to Pine Ridge for the Ogwalla and how kind of how that happened and how it was a real, how the market economy was adopted and came to be. People need to understand that history. People don't understand that history because it's been that way for kind of a long time. And so this is what people know. So it's about reconnecting. And I certainly don't think it's about shaming people. So I really hope to, to not do that and to be able to have conversations that are open and meaningful because people, I want what's best for people. And I, I want a reconnection to traditional food ways. So I'll stop. That was a great answer, Elsie. Sanjay, tell us about your background and when you were on this journey with a day uh, wanting you to spend scads of money on interviewing people endlessly, <laughs> I'm, I'm giving a day a hard time. Tell us about how your own personal background resonated in the space of doing this film. Uh, it's a great question. You know, in the in a predominantly Western system of education, we never 
really learn about how different non-Judeo-Christian cultures are related. Contact for colonial European contact for indigenous North and South Americans and Central Americans, you know, began in the late 1400s. India at the same time was a collection of kingdoms, just like you can't say there's, there's something called a Native American. There were clans, there were colonies, there were massive cultures like the Aztecs, the Mayans, there were networks of different groups that traded and had linguistic similarities. There was migration, nomadic peoples. India as a subcontinent accounted for 25% of the global GDP for up until really 1200 or 1300 AD. And then we as a culture or set of cultures made some mistakes and the first people to come and successfully colonize us came from the Middle East. But Alexander the Great, you know, marched through Afghanistan, marched to the border of what's now Pakistan and India, and he was turned away. You know, nobody could conquer us. Not only were we a strong warrior civilization, we were the, the, a, a primary seat of philosophy, of culture. I mean, there's a reason why everybody around the world does yoga and looks at the minimal aspect of, of Indian philosophy. That said, oh, it's sad. We have a pre-European conquest slash contact, contact history as well. We had villages, my father and mother's villages have, had both been existing, in existence for hundreds of years with food traditions, land traditions, the same concepts of the divine being present in different ways, in different aspects of the land. There was an integration between the inner life and the outer life, the physical and the spiritual. The British tried to conquer North America. Unfortunately, and this is being derivative, they left a lot of their, their, their people here. Those people got restless and wanted more than the British government could provide, and the British government lost access to the extractive economy that they started here. So around the same time that they began losing control of the so-called colonists, they went to India. And in, this, in, in the case of India, they decided, they realized that trying to create a colonial government was a bad idea. They were just going to go in with corporations first. We didn't get the British out of India until 1947. My father was born in British-occupied India. My guru, Sri Chinmoy, and his guru, Sri Aurobindo, were revolutionaries against the British in modern India. The saddest thing for me is that in many ways, the British were successful. Indians in India are now seen as colonizers themselves. They're trampling the spiritual and physical remnants of that village-based life. They're going to other parts of the world and colonizing it. So I come from a background where the historical trauma is entirely different, but from a capitalist structural standpoint, I could relate to the manifestations of that colonization in North America. So it was from that standpoint that, you know, First Nations and I in a day, we we kind of came to an understanding on what the film needed to be. It wasn't gonna be an ethnography. It wasn't going to be poverty porn. We, we don't even use the word resiliency. It's like, what does that word even mean when this period of contact is 400 years out of a history of 10, 20, 30, 40,000 years? This is a speed bump and things have to be reoriented, but with that spiritual basis that has led to the identity of what it means to be an indigenous person. So we, we, we came at it from the, a thematically similar place. I can't imagine the conversations you all had in the early days and along the way. What, Great what, a, trips, what sure. a rich experience at I'm, I'm a bunch of levels. Ade, can you talk to us about um, or share your thoughts and actually your heart about the power of food and language um, that just came barreling out of this film <laughs> at the viewer. Yeah, I think um, there is, you know, there's a lot of work being done out there by indigenous, 
linguists and teachers, not only linguists, but like language teachers. You know, I'm lucky in my own community that there's still speakers um, and I come from a house school of speakers, but there is a correlation much like Elsie talked about when it comes to traditional food systems. You know, there's a cor correlation between the decrease in indigenous languages and the decrease of biodiversity in this world. Not only are we losing um, our plant species at alarming rates, which is causing climate change, if you talk to an indigenous language person, that stems from us not speaking these other languages that like open up these realms of possibilities that are not accessible to the English speaking or English formulated brain. And like English itself is a very structured and mathematical ways. There's, there, and it's very, um, literal it's very literal and so when you think about some of the the poetic indigenous languages that we come from and how we interacted with that world and how we like or oriented ourselves to those relationships based on those languages we are we are so far from who we used to be that um it doesn't surprise me that we see a lot of traditional food systems collapse at the same time we see indigenous language collapse. And perhaps one of the most, I guess, poignant moments in my whole life has been witnessing the death of a language. You know, my husband's community lost their last language speaker um, a couple years ago, you know, and it's, I wanted the world to stop. I wanted like everybody to mourn that language but the world just went on, you know, it's like, how do we mark these, these places as we see indigenous languages die? And so I recommitted myself to like, to supporting food sovereignty in hopes that these languages will follow suit. And um, that, that's, that's all I could do. I think about that's such great sadness when I think about witnessing that, that lang last language speaker, like leaving us, like I don't, I will never hear it in a conversation and the world will never hear it in a conversation ever again. And so food sovereignty and indigenous languages are, are tied. And if you speak to my grandparents, they'll say like, the spirits in the world will only answer you when you talk to them in your native language. And when you only tell them your native, your Indian name. And I think that's true. And um, in the movie, you'll see like animals, come straight up to Elsie and her dad, like, you know, the, not the animals that take pants off of people, but they come straight up to the, the Elsie and her dad because they, sh they know their names, right? They can call them and um, that's the power of being indigenous and all the more power of having our languages. Elsie, I don't know if you have anything to add, not about the pants, but, but the buffalo. <laughs> Yeah, well, you were talking, that made me think of a few things. Um, first of all, you were talking about the um, the poetics of our native languages, and I'm reading Braiding Sweetgrass by Ra uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer right now. Um, I've read excerpts for other classes and just loved it, but I finally committed to reading the book, the whole thing, this summer. And she talks about language revitalization, and she's a, a Potawatomi botanist. Um, and she was talking about how English, um, English grammar lacks animicity and so it's it's in our pronouns and so when you're she talks about how it's a lot easier to like destroy a species and exploit a species when you refer to it as an it when you she's there's a beautiful line in there where she says when that maple tree becomes a her you think twice before you um before you pick up the axe and i think that that concept can be applied to to all of our languages and to all of our traditional foods and to just all of our relations as we as we navigate the world. Um, and so I think that that gets at um, a lot of it. And then it also makes me think, um, I know somebody mentioned that they had seen me talk at the uh, nutrition conference last year, but this was a story that I told because it's a story that my dad told me and that has really um, meant a lot to me. And it's something that I see as a real, um, why I'm so committed to 
making my work relevant to the realm of food sovereignty is because while while food sovereignty looks different for for everyone um i think it's something that can really unite indian country um because we all know what what it feels like and we all know how important it is and further within our communities i mean there are people who advocate for one thing being more important than the other or like no no we need to focus if we want cultural uh preservation or cultural restoration we got to focus on language and it's like well how can you how can you say no to that like that's that's true but then i'm also like but we got to restore the buffalo and my dad told me this story and it was he had he was speaking to um, one of our Lakota language speakers who, I don't know, he was giving some presentation somewhere or something. And um, a woman who was a language speaker came up to him and said, that's it. Um, I, I like, thank you for this. Um, I've been teaching language in these classes for X many years. Um, and I always knew there was something missing. Um, I just couldn't put my finger on it. I thought I was doing everything right. Um, and she said, but listening to you talk, she's like, that was it. Um, we need the buffalo and um, the buffalo are back. And when the buffalo are back, people have something to talk about. And that gets back at how the language really applies to the foods and how the foods are like that. There is, they're not separate. Um, and so if you want to talk cultural preservation, you have to talk about language and you have to talk about food systems and you have to talk about this, you have to talk about that. Um, but they're, they're all connected. Um, and so like, you can't, you can't have food sovereignty without uh, language. Uh, you can't have language revitalization without um, including food sovereignty as part of your efforts. And it shows the interconnectedness that inherently exists within indigenous cultures all over the place. And I think that's a, really beautiful thing to tap into and to think about because it can make um make our efforts a lot um a lot more united and weaving it all together makes it all stronger in my mind yeah thanks elsie that's beautiful words sanjay um I, I think we've got a few more minutes left and i just wanted to let everybody know who's listening and who joined us today that we're capturing your emails and uh, we'll make sure that the speakers uh, here on the on the webinar ha have them because there's a couple of invitations <laughs> and, uh, and offers that are sitting in those chat rooms. And so I just wanted you all to know that that we've captured them and they're not going to go away. We'll pass them on to Elsie or Sanjay or a day as, as it's appropriate. But uh, I'm going to leave a day to last. But Sanjay, what what are your what are your thoughts as we as we um, as we leave this space in a few minutes? I mean, I I always ask myself a question that I I've heard a lot of non-natives who've had the opportunity to spend time with Indigenous North Americans and ask themselves like, what am I doing to be deserving of being on someone else's land? I'm, I'm in Queens, New York City, and there's a lot of native names here. You know, a lot of Long Island cities, Massapequa, Hoppage, these are all native names. People have, have pulled out settler maps of villages on the Rockaway, you know, in Brooklyn and in Queens, and have shown that the, the grid system for a lot of these boroughs are actually on old roads that linked native villages. Um, and sadly, there isn't a, a, a traditional native presence where I'm living. I know I live on, on other people's land and I know that they're never gonna be able to come back. And so I just have to ask myself, like, what am I doing to be a good steward of, of this land that was left to me? Even though my homestead is 40 feet by 100 feet, everyone is welcome to it. So thank you, Sanjay, and thank you for this amazing film. I know we all appreciate you very much. And Elsie, uh, thank you for your amazing words and your presence in the film. And I, I just, I just want to watch it every night. <laughs> so, and so, Ade, uh, why don't you uh, close us out and, um, 
and thank everybody for being here. We really are happy that you joined us. We're happy that you watched together. Uh, but a day um, as we close out, let's leave your let let's have you leave us with our your final thoughts for today. Yes, um, Necha, thank you everybody for watching the film and for honoring us with your time. I think it's important as we go to our respective spaces at this time that um, you know as Indigenous people. We should be gentle with one another. We should be kind to one another. And no matter who you are, indigenous or not, you have the potential to be part of an indigenous food system somehow, some way, whether it be by acknowledging the land you're on, by knowing people from that community and from that land, or helping somebody from that community or that community or that land. And um, thank you again. And I hope we all have a wonderful afternoon or night or morning. Thanks. Thanks a day. And uh, Mindy and Jared, I think that uh, concludes this for today. And thanks everybody for joining us. We really appreciate your time.